Good morning, my friends. Today we will talk about uh, pulmonary embolism. You are on the channel Dr. Y, and I'm Dr. Y. And actually, I am Armen, Professor Armen Astvatsatyan from Yerevan, Armenia. And yes, we talk about talk about pulmonary embolism. So, pulmonary embolism is the occlusion of pulmonary artery by thrombi that originate elsewhere, typically in the large veins of the legs or pelvis. Risk factors for pulmonary embolism are conditions that impair venous return, conditions that cause an Italian injury or dysfunction, and underlying hypercoagulable states. Symptoms of pulmonary embolism are nonspecific and include dyspnea, pleurotic chest pain, and in more severe cases, lightheadedness, presyncope, syncope, and uh, or or cardiorespiratory arrest signs are also non-specific may include tachypnea tachycardia and in more severe cases hypertension diagnosis of pulmonary embolism is most commonly accomplished with a computer tomography and geography although ventilation perfusion scanning is sometimes required pulmonary embolism treatment is which anticoagulants and sometimes clot the solution with systemic or catheter directed thrombolysis or catheter or surgical removal, when anticoagulation is contraindicated and inferior vena cava filter should be placed. Preventive measures include anticoagulants and or mechanical compression devices that are applied to the legs in hospitalized patients. Pulmonary embolism affects an estimated 117 people per 100,000 persons a year, resulting in about 350,000 cases in the United States each year and causing up to 100,000 deaths a year. It affects mainly adults. Uh, etiology Never uh, nearly all pulmonary emboli arise from thrombi in the veins of the legs or pelvis, deep venous thrombosis. Nearly all pulmonary arise from thrombi in the veins of legs or pelvis. Risk of embolization is higher with thrombi that reach the popliteal vein or above. Thromboemboli can also originate in arm veins or central or central veins of the chest, caused by a central venous catheter or resulting from thoracic outlet syndromes. Yeah, thoracic outlet syndromes. Pulmonary embolism can also arise from non-thrombic sources, for example, embolism of air, amniotic fluid, flat, infected material, foreign body tumor. Risk factors for deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolisms are similar in children and adults and include conditions that impair venous return, including bed rest and confinal and confinal without walking confinement without walking yeah and confinement 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 without walking bed rest so conditions that impair venous return include the bed rest and confinement without walking conditions that cause and detail an injury or dysfunction underlying hypercoagulable thrombophilic disorders such as cancer or primary chronic disorders. So, pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism. Once deep venous thrombosis develops, clots may be dis dislodge and travel through the venous system and the right side of the heart to lodge in the pulmonary arteries, where they partially or completely occlude one or more vessels. The consequences depend on the size and the number of emboli, the underlying condition of the lungs, how well the right ventricle is functioning, and the ability of the body's intrinsic thrombolytic system to dissolve the clots. Death occurred due to right ventricular failure. Right ventricle failure. Uh, some uh, small emboli may have no, may have no acute physiologic effects and may begin to release immediately and resolve within hours or days. Larger emboli can cause a reflex increases, a reflex 
reflex increase in ventilation, tachypnea, hypoxemia due to ventilation perfusion, VQ, huh? mismatch and low uh, ratio, v ventilation to perfusion. Uh, so due to hypoxemia, due to ventilation perfusion mismatch, and how mixed venous oxygen content as a result of low cardiac output, cardiac output, atelectasis due to alveolar hypocapnia and abnormalities in, in surfactant, an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance caused by mechanical obstruction and vasoconstriction resulting in tachycardia and hypertension. Indigenous lysis, <coughs> sorry, endogenous, endogenous lysis reduces most emboli, even those of moderate size, and physiological alterations decrease over hours or days. Some emboli resist, resist lysis and may organize and persist and sometimes cause chronic pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary emboli may be classified according to the physiologic, uh, physiologic effects as high risk or catastrophic catastrophic or supermassive impaired right ventricle function and severe hypertension hypoxemia that requires aggressive prefer therapy and high flow oxygen high risk massive impaired right ventricle function causing hypertension as defined by systolic blood pressure less than 90 mm hydrargium or a drop in systolic blood pressure of more than 40 mm hydrargium from baseline for a period of 15 minutes. Intermediate risk or submassive. Impaired right ventricle function and uh, abnormal tro or troponin and or B brain, B type. Natriuretic BNP levels, BNP. Natriuretic peptide level without hypertension. Interesting that European site of coral theology defines intermediate risk pulmonary embolism also as patients with a Simplified pulmonary embolism severe index spacy for more than zero, thus including patients with uh, other disorders or findings. And low risk absence of right ventricle impairment and absence of hypertension and by uh, European site of Car cardiology score spacy equal to zero. Immediate risk patients can be subdivided into intermediate high risk abnormal right ventricle by echocardiography and elevated troponin and intermediate low risk abnormal right ventricle by echocardiography or elevated troponin. A saddle pulmonary embolism describes a pulmonary embolism that lodged in the bifurcation of the main pulmonary artery into the right and left pulmonary arteries. Saddle ampullae are usually but not always intermediate or high risk. So, a saddle configuration doesn't dictate a specific therapeutic approach, therapeutic approach, although saddle emboli are often large and cause complete obstruction that may be relatively thin, non-obstructive embolies. In 1-3% to 3 of cases, chronic residual obstruction leads to pulmonary hypertension. Chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension that evolves other months over, <coughs> over months to years and can result in chronic right heart, heart failure. When a large embolus, embolus acute, acutely occlude major pulmonary arteries, or when many smaller emboli continue to occlude more than 50% of the more distal vessels, right ventricle pressures increases, which may lead to acute right ventricle failure, shock or sudden death. The risk of death depends on the degree and the right of uh, uh, and the size and and rate and so sorry the risk of death depends on the degree and rate of rise of right sided pressures and of the patient's underlying cardiopulmonary status patients with pre-existing cardiopulmonary disease <coughs> are at higher risk of death but young or otherwise healthy patients may survive a pulmonary embolism that includes more than 50% of pulmonary bed. Pulmonary infarction, so an interruption of pulmonary artery blood flow leading to is ischemia of lung tissue, sometimes represented by a plural-based peri uh, peripheral located, often wedge-shaped pattern on chest X-ray, Hampson hump, or other imaging modulates occurs in less than 10% of patients diagnosed with pulmonary embolism.
This low rate has been attributed to the dual blood supply to the lung, that is bronchial and pulmonary. Generally, pulmonary infarction is due to smaller emboli that become lodged in more distal pulmonary arteries and is nearly always completely reversible. Pulmonary infarction is recognized early using sensitive radiographic criteria, often before necrosis occurs. So, uh, concerning symptoms and sign, many pulmonary emboli, uh, emboli are small, physiologically insignificant and asymptomatic. Even when uh, present, symptomic are non-specific and vary in frequency and intensity, depending on the extent of pulmonary vascular occlusion and pre-existing cardiopulmonary function. Emboli often cause acute dyspnea, not chronic, acute, of course, emboli. A pleurotic chest pain when there is a pulmonary infarction. Dyspnea may be mini, mini, minimal at rest and can worsen during activity. Less common symptoms include less common, less common, but it, but it can it can happen. Uh, cough, usually by comorbid disorders, hemoptysis occasionally uh, occurs with when there is a pulmonary infarction. So cough and hemoptysis. Hemoptysis, yeah. In elderly patients, the first symptom may be altered mental status. Uh, yeah. In elderly patients, the first symptoms may be altered by mental status. Massive pulmonary emboli uh, may manifest with hypertension, tachycardia, uh, light edentness, presyncope, syncope, or cardiac arrest. Arrest. The most common signs of pulmonary embolism are tachycardia, tachypnea. Less commonly, patients have hypertension. A, a loud second heart sound due to a loud pulmonary component, P2. Uh, is possible uh, that uncommon, but uncommon. In acute pulmonary embolism, because increases in pulmonary artery pressures are only modest, crackles or wheezings may occur, but it's usually due to comorbid disease. In the presence of right ventricle failure, distended internal jugular veins, uh, and the right, right ventricle uh, heave uh, have uh, right ventricle heave uh, may be evident. and the right ventricle gallop, or three, uh, third heart sound, S3, with or without tricuspid regurgitation may be audible. Fever when present is usually low grade and less uh, caused by underlying condition. Pulmonary infarction is typically characterized by chest pain, mainly pleurotic and occasionally hemoptysis. The chest wall may be, may be tender. Chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension causes symptoms and signs of right heart failure, including exertional dyspnea, easy fatigue, and peripheral edema that develops over months to years. Patients with acute pulmonary embolism may also have symptoms of deep venous thrombosis, that is pain, uh, swelling and or uh, uh, and or erythema of a leg or an arm. Such leg symptoms are often uh, present, of, often not present, not often not present, not present. However, so about diagnosis, uh, high uh, diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, high index of suspicion, assessment of pretest probability based on clinical findings include pulse oximetry and chest X-ray, subsequent testing based on the present probability, on pretest probability. The diagnosis of pulmonary embolism is challenging because symptoms and signs are non-specific and diagnostic tests are not 100% sensitive and specific. It's important to include pulmonary embolism in the different in differential diagnosis with when non-specific symptoms such as dyspnea, pleurotic chest pain, chest pain, yeah, chest pain, hemoptysis, uh, lightheadedness, or syncope are encountered. Thus, pulmonary embolism should be considered in the differential diagnosis of, pa of patients suspected of cardiac ischemia, heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, 
COPD, eh? COPD. Uh, exacerbation, pneumothorax, pneumonia, sepsis, acute chest syndrome in patients with a sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease. Acute anxiety with hyperventilation. Significant unexplained tachycardia may be a clue. Pulmonary embolism also should, should be considered in any older patient with tachypnea and altered mental status. Initial evaluation should include pulse oximetry and chest X-ray, ECG, arterial blood gas measurements or both may help to exclude of other diagnoses, for example, acute myocardial infarction. The chest X-ray usually is non-specific but may show atelectasis, focal infiltrates, and an elevated hem hemidiaphragm or pleural effusion. The classic findings of focal loss of vascular markings, west, west mar western mark sign, a peripheral wedge-shaped density arising from the pleura, Hampton hump, or enlargement of the enlargement of the right descending pulmonary artery, are suggestive but uncommon. That is insensitive and have low specificity. specificity. Chest X-ray can also help exclude pneumonia. Pulmonary infarction due to pulmonary embolism may be mistaken for pneumonia. Uh, pulse oximetry provides a quick way to assess oxygenation. 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 Hypoxemia is one sign of pulmonary embolism that it requires further evaluation. Blood gas testing should be considered particularly for patients with dyspnea or tachypnea who do not have hypoxemia detected with pulse oximetry. Arterial or venous blood gas measurements may show an increased valvular to arterial oxygen difference, sometimes called by AA gradient or hypocapnia. Both of these tests are moderately sensitive for pulmonary embolism, but neither is specific. Blood gas testing should be <clears throat> considered particularly for patients with dyspnea or tachypnea who do not have hypoxemia detected with pulse oximetry. Oxygen saturation may be normal due to a small clot burden or to compensatory hyperventilation, a very low uh, <coughs> CO2 pressure detec detected with an ABG measurements can confirm hyperventilation. ECG most often shows tachycardia and various STT, STT repolarization abnormalities, which are not specific for pulmonary embolism. A so-called an S1, Q3, T3 or a new right bundle branch block may indicate the effect of a abrupt rise in right ventricle size affecting right ventricle conduction pathways. These findings are moderately specific but in insensitive, occurring in only about 5% of patients. Although the findings occur in highly percentage of patients with massive pulmonary embolism, right axis deviation R is more than S in V1, and pulmonary may be present. T wave inversion in leads in leads V1 to V4 T wave repolarization may, may from V1 to V4 may uh, may occurs. <clears throat> about clinical probability. Clinical probability of pulmonary embolism can be assessed by combining ECG and chest X-ray findings with findings from the history and physical examination. Clinical prediction scores such, such as Wells score or the revised Geneva score of the pulmonary embolism <clears throat> rule out criteria PERC, PERC, pulmonary embolism rule out criteria PERC rule May, uh, may aid clinicians in assessing the chance of that acute pulmonary embolism is present. These predictions scores assign points to a variety of clinical factors with cumulative scores corresponding to designations of the uh, probability of pulmonary embolism before testing pretest probability. For example, the Wells score results is classified as likely or unlikely for pulmonary embolism. Clinical probability scoring has been, <coughs> has been best studied in patients presenting to the emergency department. One of the important cli clinical criteria, criteria is a judgment of whether pulmonary embolism is more likely than alternate diagnosis. And this determination is sometimes subjective. However, the clinical judgment of the experienced clinicians is on the sensitivity 
a sensitive S, sensitive S, or even more sensitive that results from formal prediction scores. Uh, pulmonary embolism should probably be considered more likely if one or more of the symptoms and signs, particularly dyspnea, hemoptysis, tachycardia, or hypoxemia cannot be explained clinically or by chest X-ray results. A patient's probability uh, guides testing strategy and the inter and uh, interpretation of the results. In patients in whom the probability of pulmonary embolism is unlikely or minimal additional testing, that is, their DMAR testing in outpatients may be needed. In such cases, a negative DMAR test, less than 0.4 microgram per milliliter or less than 2.2 millimeter liter, is highly indicative of the absence of pulmonary embolism. Conversely, if there is a high clinical suspicion of pulmonary embolism and the risk of bleeding is low, immediate anticoagulation should be considered while the diagnosis is confirmed without additional tests. The PERC rule specifies what eight criteria. Uh, a presence of this criteria in a clinical low-risk patient specifies that uh, the testing for pulmonary embolism is not indicated. The criteria are age less than 50 years, a heart rate less than 100, oxygen saturation more than 95%, no pre or deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, uh, no an unilateral leg swelling, no estrogen, no estrogen use, yeah. No hemoptysis and no surgery or trauma requiring hospitalization with uh, the past four weeks. Use of the PERC rule has been recommended as a way to decrease rates of testing for pulmonary embolism with controversial testing during use, uh, testing using dead dimer, dead dimer, dead dimer, but with similar rates of sensitivity and negative predictive values. So concerning diagnosis, uh, diagnosis testing, uh, yeah, yes, concerning diagnosis testing, screening of all patients with dead dimer testing and pretest probability is low or, or, or of intermediate probability. If pretest probability is likely or, or if the D dimer results is elevated, computer tomography and geography or or if renal insufficiency is present, or when computer tomography contrast is contradicated with ventilation, perfusion, VFF scanning. Sometimes ultrasonography of the legs or arms to confirm DVT when a lung imaging is delayed or prohibitive. There is no in universal accepted algorithm for the approach to suspected acute pulmonary embolism. Test most useful for diagnosis or excluding pulmonary embolisms are dead dimer testing, computer tomography and geography, ventilation perfusion scanning, duplex ultrasonography. Echocardiography may be useful to identify pulmonary embolism on the way to the lung clot in transition. Dead dimer is a byproduct of intrinsic fibrinolysis, fibrinolysis, thus elevated levels occurs in the presence of recent thrombosis. When pretest probability is considered low or intermediate, a negative dead dimer level, less than 0.4 microgram milliliter or less than 2.2 millimeter liter, is highly sensitive for the absence of pulmonary embolism with a negative predictive value of more than 95%. In most cases, this result is sufficiently reliable for excluding the diagnosis of pulmonary embolisms in outpatient stent stent stenting, a setting such as the emergency department or clinic. However, elevated dead dimer levels are not specific for venous thrombosis because many patients without deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism uh, also, have, also have elevated levels, particularly in the in the inpa inpatient, inpatient setting. And therefore, further testing is required when the dead dimer, D dimer level is elevated or when the present probability for pulmonary embolism is high. Computed tomography is the preferred imaging technique for diagnosis acute pulmonary embolism. It's rapid, accurate, and highly sensitive 
and specific. It can also give more information about other lung pathology, uh, for example, demonstration of pneumonia rather than pulmonary embolism as a cause of hypoxia or pleurotic chest pain, as well as severity of pulmonary embolism, for example, by the size, by the size of right ventricle in the uh, the right ventricle or the reflux into the hepatic veins. Although poor quality scans due to motion antif uh, artifact or poor contra contrast boluses can limit the sensitivity of the examination, improvements, improvements in the computer tomography technology have shortened acquisition times to less than two seconds, providing relatively motion-free images in patients who are uh, dyspneic. Uh, fast scanning times all allow the use of smaller volumes of iodinated contrast, which reduces the risk of acute kidney injury. The sensitivity of computer tomography angiography is highest for particularly for pulmonary embolism in the main pulmonary artery and lobal, lobar and segmental vessels. Sensitivity of computer tomography angiography is lowest for emboli in subsegmental, subsegmental vessels, about 30% of all pulmonary emboli. However, the sensitivity and specificity of computer tomography and geography have improved, improved as technology has evolved. Ventilation perfusion scans in pulmonary ratio, VQR, in pulmonary embolism the, uh, detect areas of the lung that are ventilated but not perfused. VQ scanning takes longer than computer tomography and geography and is less specific. However, when chest X-ray findings are normal or near normal and no significant underlying lung disease exists, it's highly sensitive, sensitive test. VQ scanning is particularly useful when renal insufficiency precludes the use of contrast that is otherwise required for computer tomography and geography. In some hospitals, VQ scanning can be done with a portable machine that provides three views of ventilation and perfusion, which is useful when a patient is too ill to move. Perfusion defects may occur in, in, in many other lung conditions. For example, COPD, contra uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pulmonary fibrosis, pneumonia, pleural effusion. Mismatched perfusion detects uh, defect defects that may mimic 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 pulmonary embolism may occur in pulmonary vasculitis, pulmonary vein occlusive disease, and sarcoidosis. Results are based on patients' VQ mismatch and typic are and typically are respond as normal, excludes pulmonary emboli with nearly 100% accuracy. Very low probability, less than 5%, low probability, 15% likelihood of pulmonary embolism, intermediate probability, 30 to 40 probability of, of pulmonary embolism, and high probability, uh, probability 80 to 90% probability of pulmonary embolism. This, the results of clinical probability testing must be used together with the scan result to determine the need for treatment or far, uh, further testing. Duplex ultrasonography is a safe, non-invasive, portable, non-invasive, portable technique for detecting leg or arm thrombi. A clot can be detected by showing poor compressibility of the vein or by showing reduced flow by top Doppler ultrasonography. The, the the test has a sensitivity more than 95% and specificity of 95% for thrombosis confirming DVT, deep venous thrombosis, in the calf of iliac veins can be more difficult but can uh, generally be accomplished. The ultrasound technician should always attempt to image below the polypetal vein into, into its uh, uh, trifurcation. Absence of thrombi in the leg veins doesn't include excluded the possibility of thrombies from other sources such as upper extremities but patients with suspected deep venous thrombosis and negative results on Doppler duplex ultrasonography have more than 95% event-free survival because thrombi from other sources are so much less common.
Although, ultras although ultrasonography of the legs of arms is most diagnosi diagnostic for pulmonary embolism, a study that reveals leg or, or axillary subclavian, subclavian thrombus establishes the need for anticoagulations and may obviate the need for further diagnosis, testing, unless more aggressive therapy, for example, thrombolytic therapy, is being considered. Therefore, stopping the diagnostic evaluation after detection of deep venous thrombosis on ultrasonography of the legs or arms is most appropriate for stable patients with contraindication to computer tomography contrast in whom VQ scanning is expected to have low specificity, that, for example, in patients with abnormal chest X-ray. In suspected acute pulmonary embolism, a negative ultrasound doesn't uh, negate the need for additional studies. So, in suspected acute pulmonary embolism, absence of venous thrombosis on the ultrasonography doesn't rule out pulmonary embolism. Echocardiography may show a clot in the right atrium or ventricle, but echocardiography is the most commonly used for risk stratification in acute pulmonary embolism. The presence of right ventricular dilation and hypokinesis may suggest the need for more aggressive therapy. Cardiac marker testing is evolving as a useful means of stratifying mortality risk in patients with acute pulmonary embolism. Cardiac marker testing can be used as adjunct to other testing if pulmonary embolism is suspected or proven. Elevated troponin levels significantly right ventricular or sometimes left ventricular ischemia. ischemia. Elevated brain natriuretic peptide, BNP, and pro-BNP levels may, uh, may, slide, uh, um, may signify right ventricle dysfunction. However, these tests are not specific for right ventricle dysfunction or, pulmonary, or for pulmonary embolism. Thrombotic disorder, thrombophilia, uh, testing should uh, be considered for patients with pulmonary embolism and, uh, and no known risk factors, especially if they are younger, have recurrent pulmonary or embolism, or have positive family history. Certain thrombophilias, so certain thrombophilias such as uh, anti antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, require disease-specific types of anticoagulation. Pulmonary arteriography, arteriography should, uh, is now rarely needed to diagnose acute pulmonary embolism because non-invasive computer tomography and geography has significantly sensitivity and specificity. However, in patients in whom catheter-based thrombolytic, thrombolytic therapy is being used, pulmonary angiography is useful for assessment of, ca of catheter placement and may be used as a rapid means of determining success of the procedure when the catheter is removed. Pulmonary arteriography is also still used together with, with right heart catheterization in, ass, in ass, assessing whether patients with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension uh, are candidates for pulmonary and arterectomy. So that's uh, the end of the first part of pulmonary embolism. Thanks for your attention. Please don't forget to make your donations, please, to our channel. Uh, thanks in advance. It will be highly appreciated and uh, see you in next lectures. Bye and God bless you.